I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as was just mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in a brand new department called Computational Media. And we're in the School of Engineering, and we combine computer science and innovation in media forms that involve computation. And games are a great example of this me kind of medium. They combine cutting-edge programming techniques with the highest artistry. In my research at UC Santa Cruz, I build games and playful experiences that use technology to take us to new places in how we feel and how we engage with one another. And I'm very passionate about making sure technology helps us to build bridges and bonds with one another. I think this takes care and consideration to make happen. This is a snapshot of an article that was on the cover of my field's magazine this summer. That's a great summary of the kinds of prototypes that I build in my lab. So if any of you students are curious about this, afterwards you can tweet to me or you can email me and I'll give you a copy of the article. But what I came here to talk to you about today is a topic that's near and dear to my heart that I actually just finished a book about, How Games Move Us. I wrote this book as part of a series of books from MIT Press that are dedicated to starting important cultural conversations about games. And today I wanted to share the core idea at the heart of the book with you to see if we can get a conversation going among us that can have ripples in the Harker community and also beyond. Now, I want to say up front that a lot of people have tremendous fears about what games are doing to us emotionally. There's already a cultural conversation going on about games and violence. That's a very important one to have. People, most especially those who don't play a lot of games, look over the shoulders of gamers or read about games in the press, and they see weapons and violence in these games, and they become afraid. The kids are learning how to be insensitive and violent. They worry that, kid, that games are training kids to become less empathetic, to become more brutal and dissociated. <laughs> can, you, can you play the video? And when we ask ourselves what's going on in the mind and in the soul of a person playing a video game, it can surely be hard to tell from the outside. This video is from Robbie Cooper, and he's an artist who filmed kids playing games. Their expressions as they play are inscrutable and fleeting. It's hard for parents or teachers or really anyone who's watching and not playing to grasp what's happening, to understand. <laughs> and when we don't understand things, we can become afraid. I want to talk to you today about a personal experience that helped me understand something really wonderful at the heart of games and gaming. It all starts with a bird, believe it or not. In particular, the red-winged blackbird. So, I was an English literature student at the University of Chicago, and my very first job after graduating as an undergrad was at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, and I worked as a copy editor. I would make sure that all the words on the signs and in the map and so forth were spelled right and followed the proper style. It was such a fun place to work. How lucky was I to have that as my very first job out of college, right? So, every day, change slide. Oh, sorry, that's my fault. Every day on my way to work, I would walk through the zoo's beautiful birdhouse among the gorgeous and colorful birds. But I have to tell you a secret. My heart was already hardened, hardened against birds before I ever got there. Over the years, I'd had bad experiences with birds. Once a bird swooped my head as I was just out on a walk. Another time, believe it or not, I was on the ferry to Alcatraz. A seagull bit my finger. This was actually on my birthday. It was going for this bagel in my hand, and it swooped in and bit my finger by accident. And then to add insult to injury, it flopped down and it got the bagel too. So, <laughs> even though I was moving among these lovely creatures every day, I did not feel any increasing affection for birds. Somehow the zoo experience was not working for me. But then one day, there was a new machine in the exhibit hall. It was a kiosk with a video game in which you had to try to survive as a red-winged blackbird. And I thought, OK, I'll try it. So I started the game. I chose where I should build my nest. I chose which bird to try to mate with. I guarded my eggs. I raised my babies. And then something in me changed. Having tried out the perspective of the bird in this way, I all of a sudden had a lot more compassion more empathy for birds. 
something that the presence of real beautiful birds hadn't actually done for me. It reminded me of the power of great literature to move us, to get us to empathize with someone else, to walk in their shoes. And suddenly, I wanted to get to the bottom of what was going on in this game. What made it work? How did it create those feelings in me so easily? So I asked some of my professors from undergrad at UFC, where do you go to study a new medium like games and figure out how they work to move people? And they said, go study communication. That's a field where people get to the bottom of how media work. So I applied to graduate schools of communication. I looked in a journal, I found the top schools, I applied to them all, took my GRIs and so forth, and I got into a great PhD program right around the corner from you all at Stanford University. And I signed on to work with a mentor there whose research was precisely on how people study media and how they respond to media. My PhD advisor, Clifford Nass, actually wrote this book while I was studying there. And the book is all about how computers and other interactive technologies affect our feelings and our actions. He and his co-author, Byron Reeves, did a bunch of sh studies showing that when computers act as if they are people in any way, we tend to respond to them in social and emotional ways. This might seem a little odd to the students here at Harker, because you've grown up in the age where we have computer agents like Siri that we talk to. But at the time, it was absolutely shocking. People thought, computers are technology, they're gadgets. How, how could it possibly make sense? Isn't it foolish to think that people would respond to them as if they were real people? My own PhD research, and this is actually a screenshot. I, I made this in a program called HyperCard back in the Stone Ages. <laughs> um, it was about how we read social signals in little people on screen. So what I proved in my work is that if a character has consistent signals of their personality in their, the way they move their body and the style in the way that they speak, we're actually more influenced by them. We'll actually change our behavior more. So my study was this thing called the desert survival task, and you're asked to pretend you crashed in the desert with this guy, and there are, there are these items that uh, are in the wreckage, and you have to rank them in order of importance for survival. And what I found in my research is, if the character had consistent cues of its personality, it was more trustworthy, and so people who did the study would change their answers more after having a conversation with this character which seems pretty crazy, but if you think back to the media equation, it makes sense. It's like, if the character is signaling something subtle about its untrustworthiness, that affects what kinds of decision you make. Okay, at this point, you might be asking yourself, what does all this have to do with the Redwind Blackbird game? I thought you went to graduate school to study games, to understand them better. Well, you have to realize that in 1993, when I started my PhD, there was no such thing as doing games research. I was sneaking up on my topic, and I was actually moonlighting on the side studying games and how they worked. I started volunteering at the Computer Game Developers Conference. This is a shot, a more recent shot, of volunteers from that conference. I was actually a volunteer when it was super small, and it was nearby here in Santa Clara. And I was reading, I was learning everything I could about game design and game designers. And sometimes that's what it takes to really go after your topic, even when you're in graduate school. One thing that I learned, mostly from talking to the great designers I met when I volunteered at the conference, which I highly recommend if you're interested in a field, try to be a volunteer at that conference, um, was that there was a lot of interest even at the beginning of the games field in evoking player emotions. And this is actually an advertisement from Electronic Arts when it was a tiny startup company. Um, asking, can a computer make you cry? And this was a guiding question in the growth of that games company. So from the very beginning, there was this tremendous interest in, in that in the game field. So as I was finishing my PhD research, I decided to embark on a close study of video games, basically on my own time, applying what I had learned from my advisor uh, and what I was learning from the world of game design and seeing how I could put all these things together. I talked to a lot of accomplished game designers, and I asked them all what they knew about how games work to create empathy, connection, and care. And I found out some fascinating things. One of the primary tools that game designers use, actually, is avatars. So for people who play games, you know that avatars are the character representing the player in a game, and also non-player characters. Um, and it turns out that interacting with these virtual people and creatures, just like I saw in my research, is very powerful emotionally. So one designer in particular named Will Wright, 
who was the creator of SimCity, The Sims, many other well-known games, tells the story of when he first played this game. This is a game called Black and White Creature Isle. And in this game, the player has a creature that they train who acts as their go-between with the villagers and the game world. And you can choose to mold this creature to be good, or you can choose to mold it to be evil. And so Wright talks about how he was curious. He was a game designer. He designed a lot of simulation-style games. He was very curious about the system behind the game. And so when he first opened it up and started playing, he decided to slap his creature around to see what would happen if he got it to be evil. And then right after he started doing that, he felt terrible. He felt horrible inside himself, and he was kind of shocked by that. Like, why would he feel bad? Um, it's just code. It's not a real thing. There's something very deep and different going on here than happens when we watch someone uh, slap someone in, say, a movie. In a game, the player has a choice of what to do, and these choices have consequences. When the choices have to do with engaging with something that seems to be a living being, then the consequences can really tug at our heartstrings. This is supposed to be a quote from Will Wright. I think you've got the font reversed or something. Anyway, you'll have to ask me about that quote later. Video game designers are using choices with consequences to move us in fundamentally new ways. I saw that what Will was describing could be linked back to the work I did in my dissertation, that great game designers were actually using our own psychology to design powerfully emotional interactions. So I ended up writing a book about game character design that's actually been used by many in the games industry, even nominated for a, an award. And in it, I point out how great game characters are designed using psychological principles. So I'll just mention some of the psychology behind avatars as an example. Consider a game that lets you pretend to be an amazing snowboarder, whether or not you are in real life, okay? The invention of avatars lets the game designer pull you into the feeling of being a super snowboarder in several ways. On a visceral moment-to-moment -moment level, you feel like a snowboarder. The sights and sounds in the game as you glide down the slopes, and even the vibration from the controller as you land jumps, that all makes you feel very present in a moment-to-moment -moment way. Then, at a cognitive level, the game offers you choices that all lead to you feeling like a great snowboarder. Which trick will I try? Which jump will I go over? Not, do I have my gear on right? Or, how cold will it be when I face plant? Right? So the game offers you only choices cognitively that fit right into the flow of being an amazing and brilliant snowboarder. And then, at a social level, you see your avatar dressed in the latest snowboarding gear with the coolest board, moving gracefully in front of a, a cheerful and cheering virtual crowd. That puts you even more deeply into character at a social level. And all of this creates a pretty powerful fantasy for the player of really being there and being that person in action, right? Not surprisingly, many games use avatars. Obviously, not all of them. For those who are gamers, you know, but many. Avatars are such a powerful media innovation for shaping how we feel. Most often, games use avatars to make us feel powerful and heroic. So here are some player-created avatars from a, a wonderful game, a massively multiplayer game that had a very long run that is no longer, you can no longer play it, um, City of Heroes. What a great release from a long school day, right? Sometimes it's, lo it's really nice to feel like a hero on your time off. It's a way to recharge your batteries. And that's something that a lot of people are doing when they play games. They're kind of recharging themselves and taking an identity on that's pleasurable and wonderful and empowering. However, in the last like five to 10 years, there's been this beautiful upwelling of indie game makers who are using techniques like avatars to create other kinds of powerful feelings in players. So does anybody recognize this game? A couple of people. This is a game that was actually created um, by one of my colleagues, Robin Hunnicke at UC Santa Cruz, along with other people at that game company. It's called Journey, and it's a game for the PlayStation. Um, instead of creating that all-powerful hero feeling, Journey's designers actually wanted to give people a small in awe feeling, kind of like the feeling they imagined that the astronauts had when they first walked on the moon. So they wanted you as a player to feel tiny, maybe a little bit vulnerable in this magical landscape. Um, so they carefully designed the avatars in the game and the game world itself to make the players feel insignificant, insignificant and small, but also 
buoyant and magical in this dreamlike landscape. And they created gameplay for this game that made everything go better if you found another player to work with together to make your way. Indie game designers use avatars to get feelings across about important social issues, too. Can you imagine using a game to help people understand the moral complexities of immigration and refugees? Well, this game, Papers, Please, actually takes on this subject. Has anybody played Papers, Please? Okay, a couple of people. I highly recommend you can easily find this online on Steam. It's inexpensive. Download it, play it. It's a really interesting game. Um, so in Papers, Please, you take on the role of a border inspector, and you're deciding, you're actually deciding who will and who will not pass through the border. And as the game first starts out, you're being trained in these bureaucratic rules about what sorts of slips of paper ne people need to have in their passport, and looking at dates to see if they've expired, and so on and so forth. But at a certain point in the game, somebody comes up to you when you're looking at their papers, and they try to convince you to help them, help get a relative through. They explain a terrible situation. And you suddenly have moral choices to make about whether you're just going to follow the rules or whether you're going to actually stick your neck out and try to help some of these people who have these really intense situations. So altogether, Papers, Please gives the player a very visceral feeling for the personal stakes that are involved in standing up within a system for something you believe is right. So I had written my first book about characters for game designers, but I realized, as I said at the start of this talk, that I really had more work to do. Because over the 10 years since I've written this book, I keep having the same conversation with people outside my field about games. A conversation in which people share their feelings about how concerned they are that games make players antisocial and uncaring. And so I wrote this book for everyday people outside of my field to help them understand how games move us and how game designers use techniques like avatars to create powerful experiences for players. Experiences that can be uplifting and even transformative. All this brings me back to the challenge that got me started on my path, the question that I asked. In my research, I finally found my answer to why the game at the zoo had made me like birds better. It had given me a bird avatar. It put me into the challenges the bird faced, and it gave me choices with consequences. And all of this let me experience, as I couldn't really before, the bird's perspective. And that, in turn, moved me to feel empathy for a bird's life. In the same way that Papers, Please helps players feel for immigrants in their situations. Just as literature and film do, games can move us very powerfully. They're a medium worthy of respect and also of close study. I hope that through sharing my story with you and what I learned, that you have a better sense of how well-crafted games can move us and that you take this with you into future conversations about video games and the role they play in our culture and in our everyday lives.